over from the Senate, uh, it dealt with physicians' assistance and their ability to prescribe uh, hydrocodone for their patients on a one-time non-refillable five-day supply. Uh, I felt like it was important to add nurse practitioners onto that uh, with some conditions um, throughout the process. Um, the nurse practitioners now recognize that they don't want a couple of the conditions that were put in the measure, and so we made a decision just to pull their sections from the bill. So that's simply what the changes are. And this, uh, my understanding is this emanated from a concern regarding being under the composite board of medical examiners as opposed to the nursing board as it relates to prescriptive authority pursuant to what the committee passed out in 125. That's exactly right, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Questions, members of the committee? Ms. Silcox. Representative Kelly, I appreciate you um, bringing this bill. I do have some concerns, though. Um, I guess, first of all, because we have, do you not agree that we have an opioid crisis in the state? I agree that we have some, but I also feel that people are going to medicate. Uh, if they're in pain, they're going to find ways to get medication. And I don't think that the debate and, and our probably personal opinions on, on this measure have changed since we passed it out of here earlier in the week. Um, and I understand, or at least this House has already committed to passing an, um, an opioid bill that would encourage physicians to check the PDMP when they um, prescribe opioids, correct? Yes. Is it not true also that, um, that there are approximately between the PAs and the PDM, or excuse me, APRNs, there are approximately 5,000 more prescribers then that would be allowed to prescribe the most addictive drug in the country? Well, we've cut that number now by taking the MPs, but again, I think this is a measure that's important for us in rural Georgia and uh, doesn't change my support of the measure. Um, and I just note also that there's recent, uh, there's res recent evidence from that's just been released from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons that shows that op opioid can be ad opioids can become addictive after only three days. And so you're still okay with the provisions of this bill? I haven't seen that research, so I can't comment on it. Okay, thank you. I have not been contacted by anyone with that organization, so I can't speak to it. Any further questions from members of the committee? Just to be clear, the substitute that uh, Mr. Kelly is asking us to uh, consider LC297609S uh, removes uh, the nurse practitioners from, this, from uh, the substitute that uh, the committee passed out previously. I see no further questions from members of the committee. Uh, what's the pleasure of the committee on SB 125 LC 297609 S? Vice Chair moves do pass. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Ms. Ballinger. Any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of gentlemen's motion seem by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have one opposed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Okay. Um, we call Senate Bill 1. Senator Kalzer, welcome, as always. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like well, pretty personal friends with your committee by this well, point. Well, and, you know, and it's, 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 it, friends, it's a people acquainted. business, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and just while Senator Kalzer's getting settled, uh, what he's going to do, members of the committee, is uh, speak to the changes in the bill since the last meeting. The vice chair and I will perhaps co-chair since the vice chair chaired that last meeting and can speak to that that dialogue better than I can. I, I think there have been a few changes. Uh, there may be some additional discussion in the committee. It's the chair's intention to take a motion uh, sooner rather than later. So if there are any potential changes that uh, members have to the substitute you have in front of you, which is LC 297607S, uh, please be thinking about that. We'll go through the changes have a round of questions if any if there is further discussion on any lingering issues that may be there I'd rather we just tackle those directly I don't want to go honestly round and round on them it may just be ripe for a potential amendment and we'll just do the up or down on that and then okay. and then move the bill out I, hope, I would I would hope to move the bill out yeah. um, for members of the audience I think it's uh, and who, those who may be watching that the bill and we've all gotten a lot of emails on Senate Bill 1 uh, the bill has gone through substantial changes uh, through collaboration uh, with the author who has been uh, very receptive to those changes. So I think people sometimes, and if things move, they move either very quickly or very slowly around here. There seems to be very little in between. So people, when they're looking at SB1, may be looking at a much older version of it that doesn't reflect 
some of the uh, positive changes that have occurred with the legislation. I just say that as a precaution in case people may be laboring under the false uh, uh, impression that the bill perhaps goes further in certain areas than it actually does pursuant to the draft that we're looking at right now. I think it's important to say that out loud so that there's clarity with the public and uh, what is there and what isn't. So, uh, Senator Calzert, having said that, let me ask you to, if you could walk us through it again, sure. just the changes certainly, and then we'll, we'll march on from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will do that. And, and I, you know, I will, I'll state the obvious. Uh, inaction is action at this point in the game with three days left. So if it doesn't move out, you're not going to be able to get it to the floor. And um, what I have done is followed your directions to essentially address four or five areas of questions that were posed to me yesterday. Uh, and, and I don't know whether you had consensus backing those the questions or not, but I have made the changes at your direction that answer all the concerns that were raised uh, with the exception of one yesterday. So you should have before you a new substitute. And I'll make sure I've got the right LC number. What are you working off of, Mr. Chairman? Okay, that's the same one I'm working on too then. Um, I'll just walk you through the changes line by line. At, at uh, line 35, I made a stylistic change, uh, changed the word financial to finance. I think that was the linguistically correct way to do it. It doesn't change the meaning in any way. At line 36, we added any felony violation. You will recall our discussion that we had. Uh, whether these attempts to violate the laws could possibly be a misdemeanor offense. And I think this clarifies by adding uh, any felony violation makes it clear that they would be a more serious uh, crime. There was also questions at line 38 and 39. Uh, Chairman Setzler and others complained or, or had concerns about including to effectuate an ideology of some type, so we have removed that altogether. Uh, so that will no longer be uh, one of the prongs of this offense that it be done to effectuate, advance further, effectuate an ideology or belief system. Moving to lines 89 and 90, uh, Chairman Setzler had some concerns about using the word lawful uh, speech or assembly, so we have removed that and added a phrase that's a little more accurate, I think, to say now this article shall not be construed to infringe upon constitutionally protected speech or assembly. So it removes any reference to lawful and I think more clearly states what we're doing there. Uh, finally, I added the, the portions that were proposed by the Prosecuting Attorney's Council, Section 3-1 uh, all the way down to lines 91 through it goes all the way through line 160. That is the amendment that was presented to you by Chuck Spayhouse uh, yesterday. So that's been included in the bill uh, verbatim. Uh, so I think that that handled everything with the uh, one other exception. And I think it was uh, your vice chairman uh, brought up uh, some concerns about the changes to terroristic threats. We were trying to update that statute. So those were uh, terroristic threats threat would be more than just threatening to harm somebody. It could be threatening to commit an act of domestic terrorism, which could also be against infrastructure, et cetera. So we've just taken that out uh, completely, right? Yeah. So we will not amend the separate criminal crime, the crime of uh, terroristic threats to, to update it and include domestic terrorism at all. The only other area that there were concerns about um, I uh, know Representative Trammell and, and, and Body both uh, raised some, some concerns about the subpoena power uh, that we included uh, to give powers to the Attorney General or the DAs to subpoena documents, compel testimony from witnesses without first getting a search warrant. I have not touched that. Uh, that is on page 6, lines 174 is the part that I think was bringing the questions about allowing the Attorney General or District Attorney to subpoena certain documents and books and depose witnesses without a first going through a formal search warrant process. The way we did it was we included this 
crime of domestic terrorism and pre-existing statute that gives that subpoena power. Uh, I think you could create a new section for this crime that you know something other than what's currently in 169108 uh, or you could simply you know remove this section from that and allow those uh, subpoenas to be used in the other areas of investigation that they currently are like sex trafficking elder abuse uh, identity theft those things where it's currently in code so that's that's a policy decision that your committee will have to make i did not include that in the, this redraft because i i think that's a power that would be very helpful in investigating these type of crimes but i i, I certainly understand if uh, you disagree speaking purely for myself i happen to agree given the subject matter that we're talking about not as a matter of uniformity throughout our criminal code but given the special subject matter that we are talking about I think you do err on the side of caution uh, by giving that authority to the Attorney General and the District Attorney I don't say that lightly uh, but it really does come down to the subject matter and the ability of those individuals who are elected and accountable uh, to use their discretion uh, as they see fit and are accountable to the voters if they do so in an inappropriate manner um, it is I mean, it's a legitimate policy call, and it's not right. its not an obvious choice, and a lot of it has to do with everybody comes from somewhere, and there are predisposed notions on that t giving government that type of power from an enforcement standpoint. And I share those reservations occasionally in some areas, but when it comes to domestic terrorism, I think we do better to err on the side of caution. That's simply my personal opinion, which I don't seek to impose on anyone, but I, I share your concern on that, um, right. because again, because of the subject matter. Questions for the author uh, on the changes or anything else, frankly, for that matter, members of the committee. Mr. Trammell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Senator. Thank you for these changes. Sure. I think these changes uh, improved the bill greatly. Um, one which I think may be a, a technical, but in at line 36, um, the intention of that change is, is a felony violation or a, a felony attempt to violate. Is that correct? Well, I think we're talking about committing a felony, right. but I guess, yeah, it could be an attempt as well or conspiracy or whatnot. And I would just ask if you, if you would have objection to just uh, insertion of felony attempt to, to clarify. I think that's the intent. But uh, No, I, I don't think I've objected to anything this committee's asked for yet. <laughs> that doesn't mean I agree with your uh, decisions, but I, I, you do what you want to do. That, um, I don't think that would greatly impact the bill. And, uh, I think I said yesterday, I don't even think putting felony in there is necessary because I think inherently any of these acts that are inflicting serious bodily harm, killing people, or, uh, you know, serious criminal trespass are felonies. But so if this gave you guys a little more security, go with it. And if you want to say attempt as well, have at it. Mr. Chairman, if I might ask about one other section, the sentencing provisions at uh, lines first at line 66 through 68 um, with respect to the critical infrastructure the the range there um, the, the just a question about how um, the low end of the range and the high end of the range seem to one committee members opinion might need adjustment because this is a the most open-ended section of the bill so I can imagine a felony that is relatively minor for which 15 mm -hmm. years might be excessive. Similarly, I can imagine uh, a violation of this provision which might have devastating effect, which 25 years would, would not be sufficient. Um, just uh, to ask agree. for your input on that. Uh, it could go either way, yeah. I mean, it, you could dream up a scenario where this seemed relatively harsh for some destruction of critical infrastructure you could also dream up a scenario if the airport's bombed or the port or or something where this would you want the death penalty that'd be up to you to decide what kind of discretion you want to give the judge i think there's a good point there just because you could have an individual involved in a in an episode where they may not be the primary or even secondary person involved low level perhaps on the younger side right uh, young, ignorant, involved, culpable, 
but perhaps not to the level of 15. And the broader the authority, the broader the range you have, the more discretion the judge will have to take a look at that, mm -hmm. take a look at that felon, and think about what um, what's truly appropriate, as opposed to the mastermind terrorist, right, who has at the top of the food their food chain, such as it is. I'm not deeply invested in the sentencing range. If if that's uh, your, thank you for asking. But that's uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, the only other only other question is about the provision at line 71, 73 for the for the stacking and consecutive sentences. And I guess same same general point. There might be situations for which that would certainly be appropriate, but can also imagine situations where that might be excessive. And right. You could easily change it where the sentence could be concurrent or consecutive, and you could allow for a portion of the sentence to be probated rather than than served. Is uh, the concurrent this or does not allow it? Isn't no. concurrent or consecutive? What's the, the, the well, if, level if of judicial discretion right now as it relates to the concurrent or consecutive? It's wide open for the judge right. to go however they want to, Correct. unless you have a provision such as this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's because you could see a situation <coughs> where you've got, and we had this conversation in a smaller group earlier where criminal damage to property there you know there's going to mm -hmm. be various low certainly lower level crimes right. and so the prosecutor can approach it in a certain way the judge can approach it in a certain way so if an individual needs to go ahead and serve some level of hard time but also they want to have a certain level of probation as well if they want to throw the dice on that individual mm -hmm. and give them probation sure um, to have that flexibility again depending on the offender depending on what they've done in the individual fact pattern. Right. Mr. Bode. Yes, and I and I want to echo uh, Representative Tremel. Uh, in 71 through 73, I definitely would like to have uh, some judicial discretion there, uh, not just because of the reasons we stated earlier, but because we do have the mandatory language uh, for the crimes above. So. Uh, if we're going to have lines, you know, 69 and 70, if they're going to stay, uh, pretty much some of those uh, criminal offenses under the Georgia Board of Pardons and Parole, you're going to get 90% of that time. So if if we stack, it, it, it may be a little excessive. So that way, if we have the discretion, the judge can look at it and say, well, it's a number of crimes here, including very seriously bodily crimes, which you're going to get 90% for. So therefore, uh, you could give the judge that discretion to run concurrent or consecutively. You can change that easily at 71 by ins instead of saying impose separately from, just impose concurrently with or consecutively to. Okay. You know, that, that can, you can fix that really quickly. Okay. Yeah, we actually could just remove 71 to 73 and it has the same effect without negatively affecting the bill. Is that a mm -hmm. correct statement? Okay. Mr. Setzler. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to just pause and say thank you to the leader. I, I, this is, uh, you really have listened to our committee, and, and I think, you know, and it's pursuant to engaging us on back and forth on these issues. I mean, both yourself and Mr. Eason have been, thank you. I just can't say enough. Appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, you know, it's a this whole legislative process is, is frustrating sometimes, but I recognize when we've dealt with an issue on the Senate side for really two years and then dumping on you with, you know, two or three weeks to go, it, it's a lot to digest. And, and, um, and I think you have to have the give and take because it's taken me a while to educate you. And I think in some ways the bill's perfected. I would still make my pitch, and I, I have it drafted, Mr. Chairman, if anybody has an appetite that we are not planning and preparing for terrorist actions in this bill. In my original bill, the intent was more for our state to have a plan uh, and to, to be sort of, uh, as Barney Fife would say, nipping it in the bud. You know, let's be interdicting these things. Let's have a, a defense plan. And what this is really is a response plan. This is what are we going to do after the Super Bowl has been blown up? How how badly are we going to punish somebody and how we're going to prosecute them? Yeah, that's nice, but you know I don't really think the criminal penalty end of these things deters these type of actions very much. I mean, a lot of those people are suicide bombers to start with. You know, they're not going to be there to be punished. 
what I would love to see us do is to create that Department of Homeland Security. We already have the commissioner and we have them embedded in GEMA now. I would like to consider creating that Board of Homeland Security, creating the, uh, you know, the statutory authority to have a separate commissioner of Homeland Security and part of the bill had delegated duties to that individual to create an anti-terror strategy enlisted and I have the language for that for you if you want to consider that that has withdrawn the command and control over GSAC from the Department of Homeland Security and leaving that where it is with the GBI uh, but otherwise going ahead and, and forming the board and the commissioner and the duty to at least come up with an anti-terror strategy and plan. We need to do that as a state. I guess it's a policy decision. Do you want to put that in code and require it, or do you want to just sit back and let's hope that our state's doing um, something about it? Your, your point's well taken. It goes back to a previous conversation that you and I have uh -huh. had. And I don't disagree. I think it is more a function of what the process is by which we go ahead and determine that. I think when you're dealing with so many so we don't disagree. I think we just disagree on the mechanism for doing it and the process for doing it. When you're dealing with so many agencies, or multiple agencies, I should say, with different levels of experience and respons roles and responsibilities and missions at this point, my personal sense is that you usually do better. <coughs> could be right, it could be wrong. But you do better to get them in a room and to figure out what the best plan would be so that you've got a unified strategy and and mission I don't that doesn't mean we can't continue the conversation on establishing the board I I think right. that's a continuing conversation it's not a one-sided conversation at all mm -hmm. it's not a monologue it's a dialogue right. but um, it, so I, I don't disagree with you I think it's a function of how we do it what I've noticed in in the very limiting nature of a two-year term is that there really is only one period that we have during a two-year term where you can actually step back and have that kind of um, really probative process, especially on a big ticket policy item like that. And that's frankly in the off session period of the odd number year, right. which we're you know heading into right now. I would also, so I, I would invite that opportunity, but I'd also know from a practical standpoint, it is my, it's the chair's sense that there's a lot that the executive could do in the nature of an executive order to push that process along such that if it if there's at least a framework by executive order having coordinated with such agencies that the, the legislature can then take notice of let's say in November December or even earlier and use that as a framework for potential legislation that also provides for the necessary coordination is that a reasonable statement it is with but it omits the exception that it's already in code this isn't taking duties away from anybody that doesn't that doesn't already have them we have the commissioner of homeland security and that person is also the head of gema and we call it gemsa now so it's not creating a new person a new role and it's not taking any roles away from anybody that's not already in in gemsa now it's not bothering the gbi what they're doing in any way it's not bothering what Jim's is doing it's just separating it out to keep it focused and, and defined so it, it's not the only things that this adds is the new responsibility to come up with a strategy and it, it also creates this Board of Homeland Security which would would be able to be utilized in that process so bring it is doing exactly what you're saying it's bringing people together and we itemized 17 different individuals in government to do it and what I don't think can be done by executive order at this part, point is to undo what we already put in statute last year and gave those responsibilities to um, GEMSA. Now, yes, you could add to it, and I would hope, uh, you know, that, that you would be able to come up with a strategy without it being required by code. Surely somebody needs to get to work on that. You know, I don't think you can, by executive order, just create a Board of Homeland Security, though. So, uh, no, but we anyways. can, but certainly the executive in his, I think I read that the executive here is the third most powerful executive in the country. Mm -hmm. My sense of it is that the executive at any time 
can get those age get those individuals together whether they you know whether we have the new the new department with the new commissioner the new officer the new person in charge I mean he could do an executive order tomorrow saying get me a plan within 30 days that's correct so yeah I mean t that's the, the longer way of saying we I'm ap we're absolutely open the house is open to continuing that conversation well, we will we just wanted to have it yeah have it in a you want it later. I want to have it sooner. Right. Well, right. I mean, we could have it sooner as well. It's just yeah. a question of, but I think the executive has to be at the table as well, okay. just out of number one, pure courtesy, and number two, practicality. And when you're dealing with domestic terrorism, practicality is, you know, mm -hmm. near the top, if not at the top of the list. So, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I, I was going to say just uh, to, to the senator, I appreciate your um, speaking to lines 174 through 186 with regards to a. Uh, administrative subpoena versus uh, a warrant that, that was really my only concern about the bill uh, to, to the leader um, I mean it, the way it functions here is is by adding 1611 221 the the investigation of the underlying offenses could be a murder could be kidnapping could be serious bodily harm any number of things which are felony offenses which today require a warrant to, to pursue evidence in the investigation this would be a again I don't want to overstate and be shrill in this but it, it would be an enormous change in policy to allow a prosecutor to pursue this if if pursuing a, a bombing or a murder or a, any, any number of offenses even a tapping into a into a database system um, or a financial technology system the, the investigation of that if it's under flying under the banner of of quote terrorism and, and, and because terrorism's not been established yet you know, folks have said to me before you know Ed but we're talking about terrorists here well if you establish the terrorist element first if you establish domestic terrorism and then then that allows you to pursue these kinds of war that's one thing but what we're we're trying to establish the underlying felony predicate offenses that you're looking to then prove terrorism with if by naming it terrorism in the beginning as, as charges are brought if that allows you to get around a warrant requirement to pursue a, a underlying felony charge that is an enormous hole we've created I, and I, I just say that that today we're, we're pursuing these kind of complex crimes today with no way around a warrant requirement and I think I think these kinds of powers it's, it's perfectly within the legal mainstream to maintain that warrant uh, so, so to me, I, I would just, just urge you, and I thank you greatly for your, your work. That's just that one thing I would, would urge you to, to, to consider. And, I, and I, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. proper time, I would like to offer that in the form of an amendment. Simply Section 3.3. 3.4 sure. already requires a – or Section 3-4 already requires a warrant. I'm not looking to change that at all. That could stay just as it is. But I just wanted to thank the leader. I know you're, you, you feel – you have your thoughts on this, and you've – recognize it's before the committee I would just ask right, the committee then. members that um, sometimes we can be guilty of the circular reasoning and saying yeah but but this is terrorism but no it's not when, when an investigation's kicked off we're trying to we're doing an investigate we're launching an investigation which may lead to a terrorist um, charge but at the very beginning of this we're just collecting evidence and to suggest I mean we pay our prosecutors to pursue all legal means to put bad guys behind bars I don't want to I don't want to pass a law giving them a capability and then telling them not to use it. We, we give them, we the General Assembly, set the framework and the rules by which they, they follow. So if we give them the ability to, to pursue serious injury or, or, or some kind of attack under a, and, and not have to get a, a warrant, if there's a 1611-221 investigation, then we, we the General Assembly have told them they don't need to get a warrant. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what we're saying. I think I, I think that, that that's my concern. Yeah. Well, but before you you know totally flip out here that they're going to come knock your door down. There there is a difference between a subpoena and a search warrant. Search warrant they can come knock on your door and come in and seize your property, et cetera. A subpoena is a request that you produce the documentation or a request that you submit to a deposition. It's not forcibly seized from you which needs court intervention before that happened. And what is not laid out in this version of the bill because it's not changed is subsection B of 169108, which gives you the right, if you don't want to give up that information, you can have judicial review in the Superior Court. 
true. In fact, you don't have to ask for it. You just say, I ain't honoring that subpoena. That's none of your business. You don't got a warrant. And then the prosecutor has to go to the superior court and ask for an order compelling you to produce it. So it's not quite as scary as the stormtroopers coming to your house at night and taking things. That, but I, I, don't, I don't mean to be arguing sure, no, with sure. you about it because it is a policy decision. But recall that there is a subsection B here that's just not on the text of this because it's not being changed in any way. And, and this is not as egregious as, you know, tapping your phone or, um, you know, coming into your house to seize evidence. I, yeah. I appreciate that. And again, and section B again does, um, it's, um, it's, it's instructive to us. Um, but again, um, I'm, I'm trying to read it here as I talk. So forgive me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I pulled this before the, before the it, it is a, it is a big policy question. Again, again, the, the whole point is, as in fact, as we explored earlier in the week in committee, you know, people that are not lawyered up, if you're well lawyered up, um, someone's going to tell you not to respond to the subpoena. It, it's, a, it's an inference against people who are not lawyered going into Good this, point. and I think that's, that's a concern. Ms. Quick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the Senate majority leader stole a little bit of my explanation when I first pushed my button by talking about hmm. subsection B. But, I mean, I'll, I'll just repeat that to say that we have already made a policy determination that there are certain things in this code section that uh, would permit this type of procedure in the sexual exploitation of children and the other code sections that are here. And I would submit uh, that certainly the protection of those same children from domestic terrorism is equally important on those levels and from a policy standpoint. Um, and, and certainly on, the, on a day where what has happened in London has happened, I appreciate my son's leadership on this issue, and I share his concern uh, that Georgia uh, should become a leader in this area of protecting our ports and protecting the world's eastern territory and being on the forefront in acting and not talking to this to death. So I share his frustration uh, with a little bit of what we've been through. We can't say we left where we are, but I appreciate it very much. And uh, the constituents that will share and the ones that are in the House will appreciate it as well. So Thank you. Representative. Mr. Gravely. That was, oh. I was just going to respond to, I appreciate okay. Representative yep. Quick's concern, Mr. Chairman. I, I would say, though, if you look at the, the offenses that under, under Section 108 that, that, that are allowable today, those deal with um, circumstances, computer pornography, um, stalking, things where if you study them, there's no, it's very difficult to get probable cause because there's no valid witness to give it. A child, computer crimes that's happening on someone's computer, not at, or a circumstance of elder abuse where you've got an elder, there, there's, no, there, there's no mentally fit, perhaps, elder that can, can testify to the acts. That, that's, that, that's a little crack we give in law but for, for those reasons. In this circumstance, though, a conventional, what would, would otherwise be a garden variety felony investigation could be pursued under the under the ages of 1611-221 um, by invoking 16, this, this terrorist investigation and you could be pursuing a standard underlying felony um, un, under under auspices and under under a structure that by invoking the terrorist word we all we all kind of what, what, what you know it certainly gets our attention but the underlying acts that are being investigated are no different than another circumstance. Again, if, if the, the requirement was to demonstrate terrorism f first and then pursue this, it all makes sense. And I can't, well, if, you, if you demonstrate a terrorist organization, then, you're, then you're, you're following the chain of events, you're gonna have that ability already, but to, in, to, to initiate an investigation and to be automatically able to is issue subpoenas and not be subject, it's a, it's a different structure than we've, we've contemplated for these kinds of acts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Trying to decide if the best time to interject my thoughts on this is now or as we're discussing an amendment, but very respectfully, I, I disagree with my friend, Representative Chairman Setzler. To me, what I continue to take everything 
in this bill back to is on page two in um, line 36, a definition of domestic terrorism. And that is what we are trying to get at in this. And <clears throat> to much of the, I think, leader's position, we, we've got to put everything out on the table when it comes to how we are trying to build these cases. I, I do not believe that this power will be used as an abuse or a way to run around um, a search warrant. And I believe that by referencing our domestic terrorism statute and the language that we put in here and, and what I've referred to throughout this process as what is an extremely high burden of, of showing this kind of case, I, I believe that this is entirely appropriate and I do very much believe that that should be a part of what we pass out today is to, is to authorize the use of that subpoena. The, the leader has spoken clearly about the structure of that statute and what a subpoena means and your rights in choosing to not produce or turn over certain documents. And, and um, I, I believe that this is a pathway that we've gone down before, again, not to repeat what everyone else has said, but and not to make light of the crimes that are on there um but we have we have opened up this pathway in a previous set of crimes and i believe that when it comes to being able to make sure that we are doing everything we can on what is potentially the most serious subject and going to be the storyline of not just the rest of our lives but our children's lives and so on and so forth being equipped to handle these investigations um should be our high priority and I believe that this is uh, to me an important part of what we have here in this bill and um, I am going to encourage the committee to vote if there is an amendment uh, to strike that to vote against that amendment. All right I see no further questions let's uh, proceed to a motion what's the pleasure of the committee on SB1? Move to pass. Vice chair moves do pass of SB1 by substitute LC297607S. Are there any amendments, Mr. Reeves? I'm sorry, did you call me? Yeah. Yes, I would ask that on line uh, 67 that we would amend to change 15 to 5 and 25 to 30. Mr. Reeves. Moves to amend line 67, striking 15, inserting 5, striking 25, inserting 30. All in favor? Uh, discussion on the amendment? Mr. Trammell. Um, appreciate the gentleman's amendment. I think that there, there are scenarios on the high end of the range where it might make sense to sync it up to 35, but. If it pleases the committee, I will um, amend my amendment and um, in line 67 to remove, to strike 25 and replace with 35. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion on the Reeves amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by, s oh, Ms. question, Ms. Silcox. Yeah. Oh. All in favor of the Reeves amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Any further amendments, Ms. Silk? <coughs> One additional amendment. I'd like to strike lines 71 to 73 to give more um, judicial discretion for either a concurrent or consecutive sentence. So that gets back to the conversation earlier. I mean, it, I, they have that now. Unless the that was my motion to strike those lines so that we, since we already have it, we could just enforce what we have. Discussion, Mr. Reeves. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, again, I, I, I'm going to oppose this amendment, and um, the reason why is again taking this back to the severity of where we, w in order to get into where we are in 16-11-221, the severity, the nature of the severity of, of this type of conduct and criminal offense, I believe um, consecutive sentencing is appropriate. It is, there are 
many other portions of our code section that deal with much less serious crimes that require consecutive sentencing. Another reason why, um, I know some of the discussion that has been held about, especially when it comes to the critical infrastructure aspect, is uh, under the current the way this is currently set up, it would be a um, whatever time you get is what it's called a straight sentence. So the range is five to thirty, and for whatever reason, the judge felt that that the offense only warranted a five-year prison sentence. Then that would be that would be the sentence. But suppose the judge um, believed that there should be probation after that then the way that 71 and 73 is required that by, by whatever the underlying offense is that they're sentenced for would essentially require additional sentence and um and maybe if probation was necessary after that would force that i think in in these types of situations uh, probation can be important and so um, i i firmly believe that because of the severity of this that that this consecutive sentencing um, part of this bill is important Further discussion on the Silcox Amendment. There are lights flashing. I don't know if they're for amendments or for or for discussion. So, Mr. Trammell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and to this amendment, I would just point out that the maximum end of the range for each of these offenses is 35 years. And with the provision in 69 and 70, you cannot have that. It is mandatory jail time. So what we are contemplating is stacking, I if the judge believes that the offense is a terrible offense and should be sentenced on the maximum end of the range, they're looking at a minimum 35 years no matter what. So the only effect that leaving consecutive sentences can possibly have in this bill is to take unintended circumstances and handcuff the judge so that the judge does not have discretion to sentence concurrently. That's the only effect it could have. I, I'm not sure that I, Representative Trammell, I'm not sure that I understand. I mean there, throughout the code section, there are multiple various provisions that require consecutive sentencing. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a concept that has been um, the position that the General Assembly has taken on, on several other things, for example, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon uh, requires a consecutive sentence um, to whatever the underlying felony is. I mean, there's multiple examples of this, and this is not new territory. I, are you, the way that I am reading this, and perhaps I'm reading this the wrong way, but the time that someone would be sentenced per violation of 16-11-221 would be mandatory prison time, but that the under, I do not believe that the underlying or other offenses, if a person were to be indicted in a 10 count indictment or a five count indictment, and only one of those counts was domestic terrorism, that they would be required to be sentenced to mandatory prison time on the other counts. Or do we have a, do, do you agree or disagree? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't disagree with the gentleman's statement. I just think the, the issue is if, if a judge thinks this is egregious behavior, they're going to get 35 and it's going to be mandatory jail time. So we're protected on the high end of the range. The exposure for the consecutive sentencing is on the low end of the range where the conduct is, again, mandatory jail time on the minimum and then they're placed in the position of having to sentence consecutively after that. that that's the issue. But, but, but they could also, con but they could sentence depending on the crime, let's say it's criminal with damage to property, they could go ahead and probate that sentence, correct? If they, if they wanted to, I mean, whatever the other related crimes are, they can go ahead and they don't have to go ahead and impose jail time for those other related crimes to the domestic terrorism crime. So they had that inherent flexibility anyway, is that correct? Well, they, they could probate. They, it, Mr. Chairman, you are you are correct on that. I guess the, um, I guess the point I would make is, and, and maybe it's just a philosophical. For me, if a judge has the discretion, um, in terms of the sentencing range, I mean, what work is the consecutive sentencing doing except to affect potential harm in other circumstances? And if they're a terrorist, I would submit to you that probation is inappropriate. <laughs> Okay, further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Bode. 
And I have to uh, respectfully disagree with Vice Chairman and agree with Representative Philcott and Trammell. Uh, if we had a situation where an individual was kidnapped under this uh, terrorism statute, person is looking at 70 years. Uh, that's a lot of time. And if, if they kidnap uh, uh, <coughs> three people, that's three counts of kidna kidnapping. And we're looking at over 100 years without uh, any, any recourse for probation or any su uh, suspended sentence or anything <coughs> like that. And we get those type of sentences over 100 years when, when someone is, is, is murdered or killed. Um, I understand the vice chair's concern. I think in this particular case, because of the way the statute is written, I think it's good public policy to allow our judges to make that <coughs> call uh, and to <coughs> allow them to have that discretion. Because I think if we take that discretion away from them in a situation uh, as uh, this code section uh, outlines, uh, I think that's going to be doing our judiciary a disservice. Any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Representative Trammell explained it in plain English for a non-lawyer so I can understand <laughs> the debate. So I tried to turn my light off, but I couldn't get it off. Okay. We've had so much discussion on this. This is the Silcox Amendment, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, it is. Let me ask the lady to restate her amendment. Mr. Chairman, um, if the, we just strike lines 71 through 73. Ms. Silcox moves to amend by striking lines 71 <coughs> through 73. All, all in favor of the ladies' amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it, and the, mo and the uh, amendment is adopted. <coughs> Any further amendments? Mr. Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on, uh, as, as alluded to earlier, 174 through 186 of the bill, um, the only change in that is the addition of on line 179 of or 16-11-221. Yeah, we, we discussed that earlier. I'm glad to discuss in more detail. Uh, if we simply struck that, that section 3-3, it would have the effect of not adding that to this administrative subpoena chapter. Mr. Setzer moves to amend by striking section 3-3 three 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 in its entirety. Any discussion? And Mr. Chairman, I, I, I did speak to prosecutors earlier. This is how they're prosecuting these cases now. This opens the door and, and makes makes that, that administrative subpoena process more straightforward for them. And I just think it's 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 a overreach of policy. I would ask I, I would ask members of the committee to consider that. And um, I think we've got I, I think we've got a great bill. We can get broad consensus around as we're crafting it. I think I think that I think this staying in begins to undermine the consensus I think we can get, get behind a great bill. Discussion on the Setzler Amendment? I, I don't want to be a broken record, but I, I believe that this should stay in. I believe that we need to have all the utilities that we can possibly have when, when trying to wage the fight against terrorism, and um, I believe that this is important. This is not a new concept. This is not us going in a new direction. This is not introducing something new. This is policy that already exists and I think that it is entirely appropriate Mr. to have that in this. Mr. Chairman, with all respect to my dear friend of the South, Representative Reeve, this is absolutely a new policy. There's a whole nother, really every category of felony now is, is able to be pursued if it's uh, under this, 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 this 221 code section because domestic terrorism is any predicate felony that is being investigated in a way that has a, as a the potential to turn out to be a, a terrorist, a, a terroristic um, conspiracy. So th it's not just limited to computer crime. It's not just limited to these enumerated line items. It is every felony that's the predicate offense that could lead to a, a, a terrorist determination. And I would, I mean, it, it is, it, it is a very it, again. It opens up to every potential felony that is a predicate that could that could be construed in, in the, in the, if the hypothesis of prosecution is, wow, this could turn out to be a terrorist act. Um, that pursuit allows you to go around a, a, a judicial approval to, to, to collect this information. 
and it exists uh, to, to Representative Reeves' point. It exists. It strictly exists in the code for a limited number of code sections. So y it does exist in the code for a limited enumerated number of circumstances. But this would now open it up to any felony that's being pursued as a potential terrorist case. The terrorism elements doesn't have to be uh, demonstrated before this. Y you're able to get around a judicial approval. So I, I think that's what this again. I think it violates the potential consensus we can have around the bill in it because it, it, it dramatically broadens the circumstances for which there's no judicial approval. So it's, again, to any felony. Any further discussion on the amendment? Further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Setzler moves to amend the bill by striking section 3-3. All in favor of the Setzler amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The chair is in doubt. All in favor of the amendment signify by raising your hand. Opposed. <laughs> and the amendment is adopted, seven to five. Are there any further amendments, Mr. Trammell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At line 36, I would offer the amendment to insert the word felony between the words or attempt to read or felony attempt to violate. On line 36, after the word or to insert the word felony. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Council, do you have any comment on that from the Trammell, do you want to? Mr. Chairman, the purpose is, uh, is the, I think the drafting creates potential ambiguity. It's, it's clear about a felony violation. Okay. What I'm trying to exclude is the possibility for a prosecution for a misdemeanor attempt. But you said attempted to commit a felony offense. Yes. Attempted to commit a violation of the code. I, I would amend the amendment to, <laughs> along the lines <laughs> of legislative counsel. <laughs> Jill, can you say that again? Okay. So it reads, domestic terrorism means any f felony violation of or attempt to commit a felony violation of the laws of the state. Any discussion on that? Have we, have we seen that before? I'm in the posture of receiving whatever help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> So that's just a straight policy call then. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Trammell, do you have any final comment on that? I don't, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any discussion on the Trammell Amendment? Discussion on the Trammell Amendment? 
Seeing none, all in favor of the Cramble Amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the amendment is adopted. Any further amendments? Uh, Ms. Abrams, is that your light? Ms. Ms. Coomer, no. Ms. Quick? Okay. Are there any further amendments? Mr. Trammell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would offer one additional amendment for the committee's consideration at line 64 to um, strike 15 and replace with 10. What's the rationale for that? Mr. Chairman, we have just, uh, as a committee, adopted Senate Bill 160 which provides for um, a mandatory minimum of 10 years in the context of an assault of an officer or a battery of an officer. I believe just as a policy statement, uh, it's important for us to be consistent with um, the low end of the range here with that policy. That's the reason for the amendment. Does the author have any opinion on that? I have no position on that. Discussion on the amendment, Mr. Reeves? Yes. I'll I would argue to the contrary of, of Representative Trammell on this. I believe, again, I, I take everything in this bill back to page two and what domestic terrorism is, and I believe that um, the General Assembly has clearly historically created elevated sentencing ranges for certain items, obviously, as Representative Trammell just stated. We are attempting to move forward on a, a very strong statement as it relates to um, violence against law enforcement officers. And um, not that there's much more that could be more serious than that, but when I think of the concept and idea of terrorism, um, I think we're at, a, at an even higher playing field than that. And I believe that that additional step up is appropriate The um, as everyone on this committee is aware that this essentially tracks the language of aggravated battery which is um, you have the state has to prove um, a high level of, of injury and, and malice and I believe that 15 years um, is an appropriate step up for that and so I would urge this committee to leave that number at 15. Further discussion on the amendment? Trammell moves to amend on line 64 by striking the word no, the number 15 and inserting the number 10. All in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. Chairs in doubt. All in favor of the Trammell amendment, line 64 of striking 15 and inserting the number 10. Uh, raise your hand, please. Opposed? The vote is tied seven to seven. The chair votes no. The amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Seeing none, on the move due pass by substitute, it will be a new substitute on SB1. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Is there doubt on that? If there is, I'll take the hand vote. Hearing none, the motion is adopted. Thank you, Senator Kalzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee. Thank you very much, members of the committee. We're adjourned.